Hey, I just wanted to bring you this article from IsraelNationalNews.com, which is dated today, July 14th, 2021. This is about an archaeological discovery of part of the wall that was breached by the Babylonians as they prepared to destroy the temple. And right now, Israel is in the state of mourning for the temple's destruction that the Babylonians did in that siege 2,600 years ago. And this piece of the wall has been uncovered. Now perhaps the wall was high up and they broke part of it off. And the Bible says that the walls were completely breached. The article is titled, First Temple Era Segment of Jerusalem City Wall Uncovered. Segment of Jerusalem City Wall encountered by Babylonians on eve of the First Temple's destruction 2,600 years ago uncovered near the Old City, right during the time of mourning for the destruction of the Temple. Um, the Ninth of Av is supposed to be Sunday, I believe, and it marks the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians and the second temple by the Romans. On the same day, both temples were destroyed. It says, archaeological excavations in the City of David National Park have uncovered the remains of the city wall which was built during the Iron Age. That's the time of King David the days of the first temple in the kingdom of Judah to protect Jerusalem from the east. The excavations are conducted at the City of David National Park on behalf of the Israel Antiquities Authority in collaboration with the City of David Foundation as part of the development of the National Park. According to the directors of the excavation, Dr. Philip Vugosavovic of the Ancient Jerusalem Research Center and Dr. Joe Uziel and Ortal Chalaf on behalf of the Israeli Antiquities Authority. The city wall protected Jerusalem from a number of attacks during the reign of the kings of Judah until the arrival of the Babylonians who managed to break through it and conquer the city. The remains of the ruins can be seen in the archaeological excavations. However, not everything was destroyed, and parts of the walls, which stood and protected the city for decades and more, remain standing to this day. The new section that was exposed connects two sections that were previously excavated on the eastern slope. In the 1960s, British archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon uncovered a section of the wall in the northern part of the slope and dated it to the days of the Kingdom of Judah. You know, we are on the cusp of the return of the Davidic dynasty, which is the final Kingdom of Judah. Um, the Messiah reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Carrying on with the article, about a decade later, archaeologist Yagel Shiloh uncovered a long section of the wall in excavations in the southern part of the slope. So you have the north, south, and east parts of the slope. Over the years, claims have been made that despite the impressive nature of the remains, these remnant stone structures should not be seen as wall remains. However, with the uncovering of this new section that connects with these past discoveries, it seems that the debate has been settled and that this was unequivocally the eastern wall of ancient Jerusalem. So you know, you're looking at a wall that King Nebuchadnezzar looked at. Reconstruction of the sections that were dismantled during previous excavations in the early 20th century 
makes it possible to trace almost another 30 meters of the surviving wall to a height of 2.5 meters and a width of up to 5 meters. In the book of 2 Kings 25.10, there is a description of the conquest of the city by the Babylonians, which says, The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. However, it looks like the Babylonians did not destroy the eastern wall, possibly due to the sharp steepness of the eastern slope of the city of David, which slopes towards the Kidron Valley at over 30 degree angle. You know, like I said, maybe there was more to the wall and they broke off the top part of the wall but left part of it remaining. The findings of the destruction can be seen in the building that stood next to the wall and were exposed during the previous excavations. Inside the building, rows of storage jars were discovered, which were smashed when the building burned and collapsed. There is the real truth of the history of the Babylonian siege. The siege that took place this month, right now, as they're breaching the walls and heading towards destroying the first temple. The jars bear rosette stamped handles in the shape of a rose associated with the final years of the kingdom of Judah. And once again, I have to say that that kingdom will be restored when the Messiah comes. Near the wall, a Babylonian stamp seal made of stone was unveiled, depicting a figure standing in front of symbols of the two Babylonian gods which is Marduk and Nabu, abominations to God, of course. Not far from there, a bulla, a stamp seal impression made in clay, was found bearing a Judean personal name, Safan. The findings of the excavation will be presented this coming October at the Israel Antiquity Authorities Conference, New Studies in the Archaeology of Jerusalem and its Region is the name of it. I wanted to read about the Babylonian exile in the Antiquities by Josephus Flavius, the Jewish historian that lived back at the time of the Second Temple period. And this is what he wrote. This is Antiquities of the Jews 10.131- 154. Now the king of Babylon was very intent and earnest upon the siege of Jerusalem, and he erected towers upon great banks of earth, and from them repelled those who stood upon the walls. He also made a great number of such banks around the whole city whose height was equal to those walls. However, those that were within bore the siege with courage and alacrity, for they were not discouraged either by the famine or by the pestilential distemper, but were of cheerful minds in the prosecution of the war. Although those miseries within oppressed them also, and they did not suffer themselves to be terrified, either by the contrivances of the enemy or by their engines of war, but contrived still different engines to oppose all the others with, till indeed there seemed to be an entire struggle between the Babylonians and the people of Jerusalem, who had the greater sagacity and skill, the former party supposing that they should be thereby too hard for the other, for the destruction of the city, the latter placing their hopes of deliverance in nothing else but in persevering in such inventions in opposition to the other as might demonstrate the enemy's engines were useless to them. And this siege they endured for 18 months until they were killed by the famine and by the arrows which the enemy shot at them from the towers. 
Now the city was taken on the ninth day of the fourth month in the eleventh year of the reign of Zedekiah. They were indeed only generals of the king of Babylon to whom Nebuchadnezzar committed the care of the siege, for he abode himself in the city of Riblah. The names of these generals who ravaged and subdued Jerusalem, if anybody desired to know them, were these. Nergal, Sharizer, Shamgar, Nebo, Rabseris, Sarsekim, and Rabmag. And when the city was taken about midnight and the enemy's generals had entered into the temple, and when Zedekiah was aware of it, he took his wives and his children and his captains and his friends, and with them fled out of the city through the fortified ditch and through the desert. And when certain of the deserters had informed the Babylonians of this at break of day, they made haste to pursue after Zedekiah and overtook him not far from Jericho and surrounded him. But for those friends and captains of Zedekiah who had fled out of the city with him, when they saw their enemies near them, they left him and dispersed themselves, some one way and some another, and everyone resolved to save himself. So the enemy took Zedekiah alive when he was deserted by all but a few with his children and his wives and brought him to the king. When he was come down, Nebuchadnezzar began to call him a wicked wretch and a covenant breaker and one that had forgotten his former words when he promised to keep the country for him. He also reproached him for his ingratitude that when he had received the kingdom from him who had taken it from Jehoiachin and given it to him, he had made use of the power he gave him against him that gave it, but said he, God is great, who hated your conduct and brought you under us. And when he had used these words to Zedekiah, he commanded his sons and his friends to be slain, while Zedekiah and the rest of the captains looked on, after which he put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him and carried him to Babylon. And these things happened to him as Jeremiah and Ezekiel had foretold to him, that he should be caught and brought before the king of Babylon and should speak to him face to face and should see his eyes with his own eyes. And thus far did Jeremiah prophesy. But he was also made blind and brought to Babylon, but did not see it according to the prediction of Ezekiel. We have said thus much because it was sufficient to show the nature of God to such as are ignorant of it, that it is various and acts many different ways, and that all events happen after a regular manner in their proper season, and that it foretells what must come to pass. It is also sufficient to show the ignorance and incredulity of men, whereby they are not permitted to foresee anything that is future and are without any guard exposed to calamities so that it is impossible for them to avoid the experience of those calamities. And after this manner have the kings of David's family ended their lives being twenty-one in number until the last king who altogether reigned five hundred and fourteen years and six months and ten days of whom Saul who was their first king, retained the government twenty years, though he was not of the same tribe with the rest. And now it was that the king of Babylon sent Nebuzaradan, the general of his army, to Jerusalem to pillage the temple, who was ordered to burn it, and the royal palace, and to lay the city even with the ground, and to transplant the people into Babylon, Accordingly, he came to Jerusalem in the eleventh year of King Zedekiah and pillaged the temple and carried out the vessels of God, both gold and silver, and particularly that large lava which Solomon dedicated as also the pillars of brass and their capitals and the golden tables and the lampstands. And when he had carried these off, he set fire to the temple in the fifth month the first day of the month in the eleventh year of the reign of Zedekiah and in the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. 
He also burnt the palace and overthrew the city. Now the temple was burnt 470 years, 6 months, and 10 days after it was built. It was then 1,062 years, 6 months, and 10 days from the departure out of Egypt and from the deluge to the destruction of the temple. The whole interval was 1,957 years, 6 months, and 10 days. But from the generation of Adam until this befell the temple, there were 3,513 years, 6 months, and 10 days. So great was the number of years hereto belonging, and what actions were done during these years we have particularly related. But the general of the Babylonian king now overthrew the city to the very foundations and moved all the people and took for prisoners the high priest Zariah and Zephaniah the priest that was next to him and the rulers that guarded the temple who were three in number and the eunuch who was over the armed men and seven friends of Zedekiah and his scribe and sixty other rulers all which together with the vessels which they had pillaged he carried to the king of Babylon to Riblah a city of Syria so the king commanded the heads of the high priest and of the rulers to be cut off there but he himself led the captives in Zedekiah to Babylon. He also led Josedach, the high priest, away bound. He was the son of Seraiah, the high priest, whom the king of Babylon had slain in Riblah, a city of Syria, as we just now related. And now, because we have enumerated the succession of the kings and who they were and how long they reigned, I think it necessary to set down the names of the high priests, who they were that succeeded one another in the high priesthood under the kings. And then he lists all the names, some of which are hard to pronounce, so I'm just going to skip that part and start at 154. When the king was come to Babylon, he kept Zedekiah in prison until he died and buried him magnificently and dedicated the vessels he had pillaged out of the temple of Jerusalem to his own gods and planted the people in the country of Babylon but freed the high priest from his bonds. So now we can read in 2 Kings about the siege of Jerusalem but I would like to read Jeremiah 52 about the fall of Jerusalem that's recounted here. Starting in verse 1, it states, Zedekiah was 1 and 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. And I think Jehoiakim and Jehoiachim are the same. It's just the way they spell it differently in here. And Josephus spelled it Jehoiachin. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah till he had cast them out from his presence that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and built forts against it round about. So the city was besieged into the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the famine was sore in the city, so that there was no bread for the people of the land. Then the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled, and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. Now the Chaldeans were by the city round about, and they went by the way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued after the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they took the king and carried him up unto the king of Babylon to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. And the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He slew all the princes of Judah in Riblah. 
Then he put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him in chains and carried him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. The temple in the city burned. Now in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon into Jerusalem, and burned the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men, burned he with fire, and all the army of the Chaldeans that were with the captain of the guard break down all the walls of Jerusalem round about. So now they found this portion of this wall, and they broke down the walls right there in verse 14 of Jeremiah 52. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive certain of the poor of the people, and the residue of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell away that fell to the king of Babylon, and the rest of the multitude. But Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, left certain of the poor of the land for vine dressers and for husbandmen. Also the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord, and the bases and the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans break and carried all the brass of them to Babylon. The cauldrons also, and the shovels, and the snuffers, and the bowls, and the spoons, and all the vessels of brass wherewith they ministered, took they away, and the basins, and the fire pans, and the bowls, and the cauldrons, and the candlesticks, and the spoons, and the cups that which was of gold in gold, and that which was of silver in silver, took the captain of the guard away. The two pillars, one sea, twelve brazen bowls that were under the bases, which King Solomon had made in the house of the Lord, the brass of all these vessels was without weight, and concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was eighteen cubits, and a fillet of twelve cubits did compass it. And the thickness thereof was four fingers, it was hollow, and a chapter of brass was upon it. A chapter is like a, what sits on top of a column, like a capital. The second pillar also, and the pomegranates were like unto these, and there were ninety and six pomegranates on a side, and all the pomegranates upon the network were an hundred round about. And the captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the door. He took also out of the city an eunuch, which had the charge of the men of war, and seven men of them that were near the king's person, which were found in the city, and the principal scribe of the host, who mustered the people of the land, and threescore men of the people of the land that were found in the midst of the city. So Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon to Riblah. And the king of Babylon smote them and put them to death in Riblah in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive out of his own land. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the seventh year, three thousand Jews and three and twenty in the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem eight hundred thirty and two persons. In the three and twentieth year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews seven hundred forty and five persons. All the persons were four thousand and six hundred. And it came to pass. In the seventh and thirteenth year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, or Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, in the five and twentieth day of the month, that evil Murdoch, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him forth out of the prison, and spake kindly unto him, and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, and changed his prison garments, and he did continually eat bread before him all the days of his life, and for his diet there was a continual diet given him of the king of Babylon, every day a portion until the day of his death all the days of his life. 
Now let me just go the chapter right before that that led up to that event. Um, it's kind of long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can go read Jeremiah 51. But just think about how we've got mystery, Babylon the Great, in the book of Revelation, and the beast is rising out of the sea. So in Jeremiah 51, verse 42, it says, The sea is come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. The Lord's talking about how he's going to destroy Babylon after Babylon is used to punish his people till they go back to Jerusalem after the exile. So we have in the book of Revelation the beast rising out of the sea and Babylon is said that the sea is come upon Babylon. She's covered with multitude of the waves thereof. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass thereby. And I will punish Bel, one of their gods, in Babylon. And I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he hath swallowed up, and the nations shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. And then God gives instructions for the exiles. And this is what he says, My people, go ye out of the midst of her. He's talking about Babylon. And in Mystery Babylon, he says, Come out of her, my people, lest ye be partakers of her plagues. And deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. And remember, I was just telling you that I believe that the locusts that come up out of the bottomless pit are Pharaoh and his army that are were cast into the pit of hell. And they come out on chariots of horses, stinging people with their arrows that are like a scorpion sting. This is the resurrection of the dead, of the wicked, that will come forth in judgment because he and Nebuchadnezzar were with all of these plagues and everything until they acknowledge God as the king of the universe and as the one true God. And also Nebuchadnezzar and the demons are in the Euphrates River, which I told you in my other video. And I believe that when these angels are released, this is like the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar and his army coming up out of the dead, and that they're going to torment people. And then the two witnesses will be performing exactly what they did with Pharaoh, before Pharaoh, I mean. And, um, Elijah caused the rain not to fall with his prayer for three and a half years, and that happens. So I believe these things are going to be unleashed from the bottomless pit, these armies of ancient enemies of Israel, but they're going to be tormenting those during the tribulation until they acknowledge that Messiah Yeshua is their king. And it goes on to say in verse 46, and lest your heart faint, and ye fear for the rumor that shall be heard in the land, a rumor shall both come one year, and after that in another year shall come a rumor and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon. Her whole land shall be confounded, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. Then the heaven and the earth and all that is therein shall sing for Babylon, for the spoilers shall come unto her from the north, said the Lord. As Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. Ye that have escaped the sword, go away, stand not still. Remember the Lord afar off, and let Jerusalem come into your mind. We are confounded because we have heard reproach. Shame hath covered our faces, for strangers are come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. Wherefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will do judgment upon her graven images. And through all her land the wounded shall groan. 
Though Babylon should mount up to heaven, and though she should fortify the height of her strength, yet from me shall spoilers come unto her, saith the Lord. Of course, they had the Tower of Babel in that location, so they're trying to build a tower that could reach unto God. And from that tower came forth Islam's uh, minarets. Those towers could never reach unto God. Only in Jerusalem, in the spot that the Lord chose to put his name there. A sound of a cry cometh from Babylon, and great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans. Because the Lord has spoiled Babylon and destroyed out of her the great voice, when her waves do roar like great waters, a noise of their voice is uttered. So there you have the beast in the sea is Babylon, which you have in the book of Revelation again. Because the spoilers come upon her, even upon Babylon, and her mighty men are taken, every one of their bows is broken, for the Lord God of recompenses shall surely requite. And I will make drunk her princes and her wise men, her captains and her rulers and her mighty men, and they shall sleep in a perpetual sleep and not wake, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire, and the people shall labor in vain, and the folk in the fire, and they shall be weary. The word which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah the son of Neriah, the son of Maaseiah, and he went in Zedekiah the king of Judah unto Babylon in the fourth year of his reign, and this Sariah was a quiet prince. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when thou comest to Babylon, and shalt see, and shall read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place, to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. So he bound this stone to this testimony of what would happen, and cast it into the Euphrates River, which ran right by Nebuchadnezzar's ziggurat and all of the palatial gardens of Babylon that were built there including the statue that was put there for people to bow down to and if they wouldn't bow down to it they were to surely die just like in the book of Revelation. Now we're talking about Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, Egypt and Babylon and when you go back to Genesis 15, 18, you have it say, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And what I'm saying is that the wicked dead are going to rise out of the bottomless pit during the time of Jacob's trouble and they're going to torment all those who have not acknowledged that Yeshua is their king. Now here's something else that I just thought of right as I was going to go read in Revelation 9 again where I talked about that I believe that the locusts are actually Pharaoh and his army that went to hell and rising out of the pit. Um, when you have Revelation 9, verse 1, listen to this, and I'll point out some things here. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. I just happened to think 
that ancient Egypt, in the time when the Hebrew people were slaves during the time of Moses, Egypt was known as the Iron Furnace. And there came a great smoke, as the smoke of a great furnace. More proof that this is the ancient army that fought against Moses. And that's why the two witnesses, one of which is Moses, is coming to redo the plagues all over again for the people of the nations that do not accept God as their king. I'm telling you, this is the locust, is Pharaoh's army. And I told you this was a revelation to me in my last video or the video before that, but it says, and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. Egypt was known as the iron furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So they're coming to bring judgment for the people that are refusing God as their king here. And that's why they're not bothering with hurting the trees or the grass or anything else, but tormenting these, these men that are not, uh, you know, sealed by God. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should torment them five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. These were likened to horses prepared into battle like chariots. And I read that other scripture about how um, the generals and the commanders were compared to locusts. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And a lot of times, you know, in the Egyptian things you have you have a braid you know like a wig type braid that's in the back their teeth were as the teeth of lions and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron now see they were the iron furnace and their breastplates are like iron one more proof and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots. There were 600 choice chariots of Pharaoh's army that drowned in the sea, the Red Sea, which is also called the Sea of Reeds. So this is talking about that while they're galloping, the horses and the chariots are galloping, they're making a sound, their clothes are flying back like wings, and many of the horses running to battle. 
and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. So these are chariots of Pharaoh and the wicked that went down into the pit that were from the iron furnace of Egypt. I am convinced of this, that the Lord revealed this at this time. And I'm just reiterating this from my other video because we're talking about Babylon. And I believe these two rulers are going to come up to torment those who have not accepted God as their king, just like they were tormented with the plagues and everything that the two witnesses are going to be performing. And one of them is Moses doing it all over again at that time. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And I said that I believed that that is like the bows and arrows that they used. And they're uh, attacking people with a bow and arrow. And this thing is like a sting when it hits the men. And they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So get this, the fifth trumpet is the wicked Pharaoh coming out of the bottomless pit with... Um, breastplates of iron because Egypt was the iron furnace these chariots that had you know they had the horsemen and the faces like men now after the fifth trumpet guess what happens the sixth trumpet and the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of golden altar which is before God saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So we're talking about from one point of the territory that God promised to Abraham, or Abram at the time, was from the great river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. So now we're dealing with Egypt here, coming out of the bottomless pit, this Pharaoh's army and his chariots, and now we have Nebuchadnezzar and his army, I believe, that are bound in the great river Euphrates where that testimony of Jeremiah was attached to a stone and thrown in the Euphrates River, which would tell of the destruction of Babylon in the future, which it was in the past, but mystery Babylon the Great in the great future will be permanently eliminated forever and it says loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men so I believe that one is Pharaoh and his army the wicked coming up out of hell because I told you that that is what the scripture says, that Pharaoh and his army went down into the pit. And this is talking about right by Babylon, where Nebuchadnezzar ruled. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Now, if this is not... Nebuchadnezzar's resurrection with his army then listen to this this is saying the four angels are loosed but listen it says and the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand and I heard the number of them and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths for their power is in their mouth and in their tails for their tails were likened to serpents 
and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And of course, we have the two witnesses coming that are producing plagues just like Moses did because they're coming to preach the everlasting gospel so that men will repent and turn to God and acknowledge him. And I do believe this is Nebuchadnezzar's army and that huge number is coming up out of the Euphrates River because those are the spirits of those men So it was there in Babylon that they were actually worshiping devils and idols of gold, silver, brass, and stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. So they're coming up out of the earth to torment those during the time of the tribulation until everything is cast down. And Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, comes to reign as the only restored kingdom of Judah. The Davidic dynasty will return with the Messiah coming to reign. And all of these kingdoms will be put down forever. Now, let, this is getting very exciting. Let's go to Revelation 11. Now, I was just in Revelation 9, talking about those things. In Revelation 11, this is when we have the two witnesses. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which was without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now get this. Think about what I said about Pharaoh and his army, Nebuchadnezzar and his army coming up out of the Euphrates River and the pit of hell. We have this part in verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, 
The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead body three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were the slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh trumpet says, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And it's actually in this verse that we see that the time of the dead that they should be judged happens. So now we're having this huge battle with these ancient demonic spirits of these ancient kings and Christ comes and takes over the earth and his kingdom is established forever and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God saying we give thee thanks O Lord God Almighty which art and wast and art to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come at the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. And there were lightnings of voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So what you have here is I'm saying that these armies are coming up out of the pit to torment men that have not accepted God as their king. And then God is going to the time of the dead that they should be judged is right there in Revelation 11. So they came bringing all this torment and everything, but now the time of their judgment has come. And now the time of their kingdoms coming to a complete end forever. And the judgments of Babylon and Egypt coming forever of those kingdoms, those ancient kingdoms. And Christ is coming to reign, the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth is coming, the King is coming. Have you accepted your King? I ask you, Israel and everyone else in all the nations, because if you don't accept him as the King, these torments are going to come upon you, and you don't want that, do you? You don't want to see fearful sights that are going to terrify men so bad that their hearts will be failing them for fear. And I don't know about you, but if I saw these ancient armies that were uh, wicked armies coming up out of the earth, out of the pit, and out of the Euphrates River, I would be a little bit horrified. And that is a huge army that's coming out of the Euphrates River. So I definitely believe that this is an interesting thing that the remnants of a wall that Nebuchadnezzar actually probably looked at and saw during his siege of Jerusalem was actually just 
unearthed and discovered and this is in the news during the time that the temple and the walls of Jerusalem were besieged and the ninth of Av for the temple destruction but the three weeks leading up to the ninth of Av are the complete time of mourning for Jerusalem and now our king is coming can you believe this God is the one revealing this stuff through his Holy Spirit's power and you are hearing it and this is why Moses and Elijah are coming because they are going to give the last gospel message of their testimony of what they witnessed when they spoke to Messiah Yeshua on the Mount of Transfiguration which was Mount Sinai they appeared there and they're coming back and they were witnesses of his resurrection you better get ready because for this to all come out now you must have the chills like I do I'm grateful that God gave me a moment of time to record this message. Consider that I do a lot of work for this channel and um, I do it out of the love of my heart. And anything to propel this testimony so that the whole world can know will be a huge blessing to the world and save many people from perishing in this situation. God bless everybody. I hope you enjoyed this segment. Shalom.